Hello, and welcome to Decision Points, the U.S.-Israel relationship. My name is David Murkowski, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and the Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations, and I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. Our episode this week focuses on the Johnson administration in the weeks leading up to the 1967 war known as the Six-Day War. American and international commitments after the 1956 Suez War placed UN peacekeepers in the Sinai Desert as a security buffer between Egypt and Israel. It also declared the right for open navigation of the Straits of Tehran, a vital waterway for Israel located below its southern tip. Israel said it would view the removal of the peacekeepers and the closing of the straits as a provocation. In 1967, Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser was viewed by conservative Arab monarchs in Saudi Arabia and Jordan as someone whose attention was elsewhere, and he neglected the wars with the new Israel. Nasser saw the confrontation with Israel as a way to burnish even further his pan-Arab credentials. On May 13th, the Soviets sent faulty information to Egypt and Syria, saying that Israel was amassing troops on the Syrian border. Nasser sent troops into the Sinai Desert in retaliation. He also confined the peacekeepers to their base and then removed them entirely. On May 21st, Egyptian troops entered Sharm el-Sheikh at the opening of the Straits of Tehran. However, Nasser did not close the Straits right away, but instead waited in order to gauge potential Israeli and American reactions to this move. On May 22nd, Johnson sent a message to Nasser, telling him not to close the straits, but instead to negotiate. But the message didn't arrive until the 23rd, after Nasser had already closed the straits. Johnson had a great personal and emotional affinity for Israel. The Middle East, however, was a secondary foreign policy focus because of the raging Vietnam War. Johnson's main goal in managing the conflict in the spring of 1967 was neither to defend Israel nor to defeat the Arab nationalists, who he was keenly aware were being used by the Soviets in the Cold War. Soviet Ambassador Fedorenko gives solid support to the United Arab Republic, accusing the U.S. of playing partisan politics and of backing Israel. He also demands the withdrawal of the Sixth Fleet from the Mediterranean. Instead, Johnson aimed to avoid a war in the Middle East. Johnson had to consider congressional and public response to involvement in another foreign conflict with limited U.S. interests at stake. The State Department and the Pentagon were less than enthusiastic to further extend their thinly spread resources for another military conflict. Unilateral American action was entirely out of the question. Plans for a multilateral naval flotilla known as the Regatta to break Egypt's blockade on the Straits were not gaining support. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs even said that it may have been an act of war. Both Johnson and Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol continued to buy time. The United States, both within and outside the United Nations, is prepared to join with all the other great powers, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and France, in a common effort to restore and maintain peace in the Middle East. Johnson attempted diplomacy with the Egyptians and the Soviets, and Israel first sent its foreign minister, Abe Iban, to Washington. The goal of the Iban visit was to see if the U.S. could undo what Nasser had done, open the straits, send the troops so they're not perched on Israel's border in the Sinai Desert, and return the situation to the status quo. However, this produced no results, and Iban returned to the Israeli cabinet empty-handed. Later, Eshkol decides he's going to send Mayor Amit the head of the Mossad, and this time they reformulated the question. Let's assume there is a war, and Israel is going to act. What would the U.S. do? Amit interpreted the response he received from Secretary of Defense McNamara and CIA Director Helms as a yellow light. On June 5th, Israel launched a preemptive strike, destroying the Egyptian and Syrian air forces and officially starting the Six-Day War. Our guest today is Dr. William Quant, a professor at the University of Virginia and a former senior director at the National Security Council in both the Nixon and Carter administrations. Quant is part of the U.S. negotiating team at the successful Camp David Accords and the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty in the late 1970s. I think it's fair to say that Bill Quant is the dean of diplomatic historians on the Middle East, 
His books, Peace Process and Decade of Decision, American Policy Towards the Arab-Israel Conflict, 1967-1976, I think are must-reads. Bill, thanks again for joining us. I hope I didn't embarrass you by saying that I see you as the dean of diplomatic (laughs) historians on the Middle East. So I really would love to hear your perspective. I think we could begin by talking about how did 56 shape 67? I mean, there's a dramatic point, it seems to me. Abi Iban is coming to the White House on the eve of the 67 war. And the people in the White House are scurrying to find out what did Eisenhower exactly commit to after 56? And I think one of the Rostows or leading officials were sent to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where Eisenhower was in retirement. Give us a sense of that. And, and what did the Eisenhower administration commit to, to keeping the straits open? And how did that impact the way Johnson thought? Well, as part of the negotiations that resulted in Israel's eventual agreement to withdraw from Sinai in 1956-57, the Americans said that they would undertake to keep the Strait of Tehran open to international navigation, which had been a major concern of the Israelis, and it was their one tangible gain out of the 1956 war. And that was a publicly known American commitment. There was no secrecy about that. Uh, What was less well known was that in addition to this formal written commitment, Secretary of State Dulles had written a handwritten addendum on a document that was supposed to be in the State Department uh, recording what he had told the Israelis as a private reassurance, namely that if the United States was unable to reopen the straits, it would recognize Israel's right to use force if necessary to open them. So that was what was not generally known. And the State Department couldn't find any copy of it. And so when the Israelis realized that the Americans may not be able to do what they had promised to do, they pulled out their copy, or at least their record of this, and said, well, you know, you Americans did promise to recognize our right to use force if necessary. And that was news to most people in the State Department. And hence, they said, we better go check with Eisenhower to see if that commitment really is hard and fast because we can't find our record of it, which happens in bureaucracies. You know, after 10 years, people are no longer around who once knew. And I think it was also Johnson's way of wanting to make sure that he would not be criticized by a still respected former president who, after all, in 1956 had been quite tough on the Israelis. Johnson had been on the other side of that debate at the time as Senate Majority Leader. So it was both political, but it was also genuinely people did not know about the so-called Dulles Addendum, but it was accurate that Dulles had made this commitment. So they go to Eisenhower, and what does Eisenhower say? Eisenhower apparently says, yes, that is a commitment that we gave them, an oral commitment, and Dulles did record it, and it should be somewhere. But I'm not sure to this date that anybody's found the American copy of it. So Johnson was really, the sense was by 1967, he was very preoccupied by Vietnam. Yes. That it was the raging crisis, Gulf of Tonkin resolution that set off a chain of events, meant that the United States was in this war. And so he wasn't just looking at the Mideast as a standalone, but within this wider context of what he's seeing and he's deeply involved in. Is it fair to say that without understanding Johnson's deep involvement in Vietnam, you really can't understand this period? I think that's true. I mean, Johnson's a complicated figure. Vietnam is becoming this burden that he can't get rid of. He can't end the war. He can't win the war. And, of course, he's got an election coming up in 1968, and he's a pure politician. He's already thinking about that, and he doesn't know if— The crisis in the Middle East is going to add to his problems, but he knows it's a distraction from the two things that he needs to be thinking about, which is how to deal with the whole Vietnam business and how to get ready for 1968. And he says to Iban, you're only, what was the phrase, like you're only alone if you go it alone. What is Johnson basically, what's his advice to Iban? Well, basically this phrase, you'll only be alone if you go on your own, or something very much like that, had been recommended by Dean Rusk, which was his way of saying, don't do anything without checking with us first, which, of course, was don't do a Suez on us. Suez, the Israelis had not 
informed Eisenhower that they were going to launch this operation. And that was one of the reasons Eisenhower was so angry at them. And Johnson's basically saying, don't do that to me. If it turns out that you've got to take action, at least let me know. So that's very interesting because what I hear from you is that he's not saying you can't go to war, but just keep us in the loop, keep us posted. Well, he does say more than that to Ebon. He also says we can't imagine that you will do that. That is that you will take action without letting us know. He is telling him, give us time. He specifically asks for at least two more weeks to see if diplomacy can work. And they're meeting on, I think, May 20. 5th or 6th or 7th or something like that. He's asking for basically two more weeks, which essentially the Israelis right. give him. Right. And they say, we don't expect anything to happen in that time frame, which becomes a bit of a controversial issue. Anyway, Ebon gets the impression that, that Johnson genuinely wants to try diplomacy. And he reports this back to his cabinet, his prime minister. And some people in his cabinet think, you didn't get the message right. What you heard Johnson saying really was, if you need to go on your own, do so. Just let us know ahead of time. But it was more of a, a kind of, we understand that you may have to go to war. Just don't catch us blindsided. Not don't do this because we think it's a mistake. And I'm not exactly sure what Johnson meant. When Ebon left, Johnson turned to, I believe it was Walt Rostow, who was his national security advisor, and said, we may regret a week or two from now not having given Ebon more to work with when he goes back home, like a stronger American commitment or we'll you know, take an initiative uh, or we'll really send this, this fleet through the uh, strait to reopen it. He realized that he wasn't giving him much to work with, which was true. When he got back, the Israeli cabinet listened to this and they split down the middle exactly half and a half. And that's why Eshkol said, well, since we don't have a consensus, we need to at least give the Americans the two weeks. And during that period, we have to figure out what we can do. Yeah. You know, Eshkol is this figure I think is often underrated in history where, you know, he's not the war hero of Rabin right. and he doesn't have that charisma. He's an Eastern European. He speaks Hebrew with a Yiddish accent. He's got all these generals that are kind of breathing down his neck saying, hey, you know, we, we're squandering the element of surprise because we're facing the Egyptians. They're perched on the border. Uh, we have to act. And Eshkol doesn't want to act without having America's blessing, right? So he then, to pick up your point about saying, give me more time, and if you're going to act, just let us know in advance, this is the opening really for Eshkol to say, well, you know what? We're going to send a second Envoy. This time it's going to be Mayor Amit, the head of the Mossad, and we're going to reformulate the question about what would the U.S. do if Israel did act, it seems to me. I mean, do you think that's fair and that, you know, Amit got a, maybe a different response because he came with a different question? I, I think it's actually pretty complicated because in this period several things happen. There is a moment when there is some genuine fear that the Egyptians might launched their own preemptive strike on May 27th, 28th. And both the Americans and the Russians step in diplomatically to warn the Egyptians not to do so. And actually, it does seem as if the head of the Egyptian military was considering, without Nasser's authority, carrying out an airstrike against Dimona. Right Now, it didn't happen because Nasser got told not to do it by the Russians and by us, and he realized that his own control over the military was a little bit shaky. So that was one thing that had happened and had gotten the Americans more concerned that war could happen by miscalculation. And they had used this joint initiative with the Soviet Union, which was diplomacy, and it, it did seem to have worked. So they had bought a little bit of time. So what did they do with the time? They did send an emissary to see Nasser on the, it was about the 30th or 31st of May. And then the word back from Nasser was very ambiguous because he said, we will not initiate hostilities, but we're pretty sure that the Israelis will. But it's not going to be like Suez. And what we expect from you Americans is to not intervene. We have to have this, fight this out. But when it's over, we want you to engage in diplomacy to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
So that was a kind of message that the war is going to happen not because we initiate it. So there's a kind of fatalism on the Egyptian side. They didn't say, help us find a solution to this. So I think that was one sense that we don't really have a diplomatic option on the Egyptian side. The Israelis are getting nervous. And we don't have a military option to reopen the Strait of Tehran because the Pentagon isn't getting this so-called uh, Red Sea Regatta organized because they don't have any capabilities in the vicinity. It's two weeks away to get things from, from Vietnam. So uh, around the 30th or 31st, Johnson begins to act as if he doesn't see any chance of finding a good solution. And at that point, Epi Evron, who is the number two person in the Israeli embassy, goes to the White House to see Walt Rostow, not to see the president, although he knew the president quite well. But he sees Rostow and he says, you know, up until now, we've been talking about you're doing something to reopen the strait, but remember that you did recognize our right to take action if necessary. I think the time has come for you to consider that that may be the way things are going to have to go, but it will be a limited strike, just limited to Egypt to reopen the straits. And what would your view on that be? Now, interestingly, Johnson never responds directly to that. He does send a letter to Eshkol a couple of days later. He says, we have heard from your minister, Evron. He doesn't say, and I understand. He just says, we've heard. And about the same time, Meyer Amit, the person you referred to, head of Mossad, uh, arrives and does not seek an appointment with anybody at the White House, including not Johnson, not Rostow, nobody in the State Department. So interestingly, kind of avoiding the, the obvious people who might know whether a diplomatic alternative is available. He goes to see first the head of the CIA, and he basically says, Ebon told you that there would be a two-week window in which you could try diplomacy. We have the impression that nothing's going to happen, and we're running out of time. He didn't say exactly how much time remained, but he said, we're running out of time, and let me tell you why. And this is the part that's not very well understood. He said, we know, and it's in the protocol that Richard Helms writes and sends over to the White House. Richard we, Helms, the head of the CIA. The head of the CIA. He says, if war begins, however it begins, we know that the first target that the Egyptians will aim at is Dimona. And they, they've been carrying out simulated airstrikes against Dimona. In fact, they've overflown Dimona in the last week, and we couldn't stop them. It takes seconds to get across the border and back, or minutes, but, you know, it's, we just couldn't do anything about it. So we know that if war begins, they're going to attack Dimona, and we cannot allow that to happen. He doesn't say because, you know, there are nuclear bombs in the basement there, although there probably were at that time. And so he says, we're not going to allow ourselves to be attacked first. He doesn't say we will, the logical conclusion is we will attack first, but he says we can't allow that to happen. And that's all he says. He doesn't say, tell me if that's okay or not. And Helms had no policy role, but he did send a copy of that message, which is now in the public domain, to both McNamara and Rusk and, of course, to the president and, and Rasta. So in the only communication that exists between Johnson directly and Eshkol prior to the outbreak of the war, he says, we have heard the messages from both Epi Evron and Meyer Meat. And then he repeats, but as I have said, you'll only be on your own if you go on your own. And we can't imagine that that will happen. And that's the last communication he directly has. Now, interestingly, Johnson then goes, leaves town and he goes to his ranch. I guess it's the, uh, uh, not Labor Day, Memorial Day weekend. And he goes down to the ranch and he's out of touch. He doesn't take any foreign policy advisors with him. It's almost as if I'm out of here. Now, the last conversation he has with anybody who talks to the Israelis is with Abe Fortas. It was a Supreme Court justice. Supreme Court justice, but very close to Johnson, very close to the Israelis, and had been in a very important National Security Council meeting. Johnson had invited him in. It's very probably unprecedented for an acting Supreme Court justice to be asked to join a discussion. 
And the discussion was about, you know, what are our options? And at one point or another, you know, the, Johnson's very clever. He doesn't tell people his views. He goes around the table and asks everybody what they think he should do. And a lot of people are saying, you know, the Israelis just will win in no time. Just let them go at it. Others say, well, you know, we buy for a little bit more time. You know, diplomacy needs a chance to work. And Fortas finally speaks up and he says, everything you're being told by your State Department, defense people, it's simply doesn't make sense. You, you can't stand aside and say, let the Israelis go and let they'll be on their own. Said, if they're going to go, they have to know that you support them. You can't be indifferent and you need to give a clear sign of that. And Johnson didn't want to do that because he felt if he gave them a clear green light to go to war and they got in trouble and he couldn't do anything, he would be blamed for encouraging them them to do something that was beyond their means to handle. But, and, and Fortas was the one who said, you, you know, you can't leave it that way. You can't just sort of let nature take its course. And if they, if they think they need to go to war, they can go to war, but then they have to bear the responsibility. So the Israeli ambassador to Washington, Abe Harmon, is about to go back for the final discussions with Amit to decide whether to go to war imminently or give Johnson another week or so. And he decides to stop by and see Fortas on his way to the airport. And he goes to see Fortas, and we don't know what happened in that meeting, except from indirect sources. But Fortas's law clerk was at the door as Harmon was leaving, and he heard this exchange. This was Fortas speaking to Harmon. He said, Rusk will fiddle while Israel burns. If you're going to do it, do it, and the president will understand. And so we, we know from Ebon and others that this message from Fortas was the closest thing they had to Johnson's said this to somebody, or at least Fortas is implying that he knows Johnson will understand. But don't wait for him to tell you. He will understand. That, along with Amit saying they have no plan, and I've told them it's just a matter of days, that tips the balance in the Israeli cabinet discussion. And Eshkol says, in that case, you've got two days to plan it. Wow. That's, that's very dramatic. But Johnson never directly gets on the phone. To, to, yeah. This is pre-telephone diplomacy. Yeah. Nor does Eshkol ever call him and say, do I understand correctly? They infer it. And they correctly infer it with one, one caveat. And this is, again, it's in the public domain now, but it's not very well known. On the second or third day of the war, it was clear that the Israelis were winning. We're going to win overwhelmingly. And so there's a meeting of the National Security Council. And, you know, Mac Bundy's there and Rusk is there and McNamara's there and all these people are there. And they're kind of joyful because, you know, the Israelis are going to handle it on their own. We're not going to have to go to the bail them out. You know, Nasser's going to be humiliated. The Russians are going to be humiliated. And Johnson listens to all this. And he intervenes and he says, don't be so sure that this is a good thing. Wars have a way of not solving problems. And I keep thinking as I read this, he's thinking Vietnam. He said, wars have a way of not solving problems. We may wish someday we had tried to find a diplomatic solution more seriously. Fascinating. What's fascinating is also what, you know, when you look back at the time, I mean, now in retrospect, it's like, oh, of course, Israel won, triple the size with the Golan, the Sinai, uh, Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, you know, with the war. But in advance of the war, there's a lot of uncertainty. You just don't know. I mean, on the public domain in Israel, they were digging mass graves at the Yarkon Park, which is like the central park of Israel, because they thought the last war, uh, 1% of their population was killed. In retrospect, it's like, oh, yeah, well, there's a cakewalk for Israel, but there's a lot of uncertainty on the eve of a war. You don't know sure. exactly how it's going to turn out. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the, the occasions where the Israelis did have a plan. They caught them by surprise. Everything worked out according to... That doesn't always happen in <laughs> military right. operations. Right. You know, somebody gets wind of it. They disperse the planes. You know, there are lots of things that could have happened. I mean, the crazy things happened on the Egyptian side that made it easier for this to succeed. Like the head of the Egyptian military had gone out to investigate the situation 
on the eve of the attack and they had turned off all the radars because they were afraid that they'd pick his plane up and shoot it down. And so just by chance or maybe by very good intelligence, the Israelis attacked just at the optimal time when the Egyptians didn't see anything coming, even though they were flying a different route and so forth. But, you know, a lot of things worked just the way that the most optimistic scenario could have predicted. But in wars, things don't always work that way. So my last question is, you know, in the big picture, just, you know, someone who's written so much about the history and I, you know, you have a whole book called The Peace Process and some ways that emerges from the Six-Day War that, uh, you know, the Soviets could help you in militarily, but they can't help you diplomatically. And if you're, you know, the road to Jerusalem is going to go through Washington. So suddenly Israel's got assets to bargain with, bargaining chips, the Sinai Desert, which is critical to peace with Egypt. How central is the Six-Day War, in your view, in making the United States the preeminent diplomatic actor that now everyone's got to talk to the U.S. if they want their land back? It's obviously one of the, the big events of the 20th century in the Middle East. It's comparable to 1947-48, to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. It, it sort of re changes the geography of a, a crucial area. And in terms of the geopolitics surrounding it, it means the United States was always going to be influential just because it was a major power, but it puts it into a, a different position. The United States, it's hard to remember, had a fairly standoffish relationship with Israel before 1967. We did not provide significant military assistance. We didn't supply much economic assistance. Of course, we had diplomatic support, but even then, in 1956, we hadn't supported the Israeli attack on Egypt. So The first weapon system is sold in 62, the Hawk the right, defensive system. Right. And so Israel fought the 1967 war essentially with French and equipment that had come out of Germany and all of it was kind of coordinated with the United States. But with 1967, Johnson starts treating Israel more like an ally. The first approval of significant aircraft sales takes place 66, 67, accelerated after 1967. And that just continues. And then the United States with the Soviet Union and, and working it with the British gets a UN Security Council resolution, which that the Russians do vote for, a UN Security Council Resolution 242, which does lay out the ground rules for possible negotiations, which envisage the trade of land for peace, which is the simple way of translating what the resolution calls for. But basically it says Israel will not have to withdraw from that territory unless it is offered peace and security. But if it is offered peace and security, that's the bargaining chip. They, it isn't going to be like 56 with Eisenhower where he just tells Israel withdraw. No. This is going to be, you it's, know, you can get a full peace treaty, but you're going to have to give land in right. return. It's a two-way street. Right. And for Egypt, the message gets through that if we want our territory back, we need to work with the Americans. And that's the one part of UN Resolution 242 that was carried out pretty much as the drafter says it envisaged it. Full peace for full withdrawal. Alas, the rest of it remains unfinished. On that note, I want to thank you so much for a very stimulating conversation. I know you added a lot to my understanding of some of the finer points in, in the run-up to 67, and I just want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. This was a fascinating interview with Bill Quant, who's spent a lot of time really excavating the run-up to the 67 war. Talking to Bill Kwan really gives you um, as close as we can to a bird's eye view of what was going on on the eve of the 1967 war, which, as Bill Kwan says, in terms of the Middle East, turns out to be a watershed moment, perhaps one of the most important moments of the 20th century. Next week, we're going to talk about the 1973 war, which was the last war, interstate war between Israel and Arab states. And this was a moment that actually then leads to peace between Egypt and Israel. Thank you all very much for listening. I would urge you also to look at the book that Dennis Ross and I wrote, 
called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. A lot of declassified material coming both from State Department archives and the archives of Israel. Please go to your favorite podcast app, subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends. I want to thank all of those who made this podcast possible. Basha Rosenbaum, Richard Myron, and Anouk Millet of Earshot Strategies. Paul Woody Woodhull of District Productive on Capitol Hill. Scott Boxer, Rena Wasserstein, and David Patkin. Music.